Okay, so hello everyone. Welcome back to PMFIS Current Affairs Test Series. My name is Ashish Malik, and this is the discussion on test number four. In this particular part, we would be discussing the next twenty questions from sixty-one to eighty. And if you are liking our videos, don't forget to subscribe our channel. And I really, really hope the first three parts they were of immense uh, importance for your preparation for the upcoming exam, guys. If you want to boost up your preparation of the upcoming prelims, I suggest you to check out. Are one thousand very high quality MCQs uh, at just rupees four ninety nine. Now this is a test series that you actually require to boost up your preparation of the prelims. So do check out the link is given in the description below. The question number sixty one, which was asked with respect to Shukriyan one. Now look at the first statement. As you know, the word Shukr Shukriyan relates to the Venus. and the first statement says that this is a mission about mars it is not the mission of the mars mars we call mars as mangal right we have already seen that we have got the mangalyaan uh, a few years back right so shukriyan is about the venus exploration not the mars exploration so that first statement goes straight away wrong second statement is wrong uh, second statement is right in this case because it says that shukriyan 1 is going to be launched by either gslv mark 3 or mark 4 why gslv because <clears throat> whenever there is going to be a heavy payload for every heavy payload uh, missions we are using the gslv which is geosynchronous satellite launch vehicles the mangalyaan that we launched was comparatively of less payload and that is why it was it was launched using the pslv the polar satellite launch vehicles so for every uh, low or intermediary payloads we use pslv for the heavy payloads we use the geostationary satellite launch vehicles okay now in this case it was a very easy one i i I'm, i'm sure everyone must have attempted that to get you to little bit more uh, detail about the Shuk uh, the shukriyan one mission like i told you it's a venus mission which type of mission it is it's a orbiter mission now be very careful recently we all have seen the chandrayaan 3 mission right that was a lander rover mission now you you have seen that the way we have landed and we got our uh, uh, rover as well so lander rover mission missions are those where the satellite is going to land on that particular celestial object orbiter missions are only those which, which uh, like the task is to orbit the celestial body collect the information and pass it on the earth shukriyan 1 particularly is going to study the venus geological structure means its composition its volcanic activity what kind of atmosphere does it have and what what is the kind of solar wind interaction it shows so all these kind of things will be studied under the shukriyan 1 and like i told you that it it is going to use a gslv for the heavy payloads so these are the various payloads it would be carrying along with it and all of them like like when it comes to uh, venusian neutral analyzers or ground penetrating radars or high resolution synthetic aperture radar which is called sar all of them are heavy payloads that's why gslv is required and it is more appropriate question number 62 was with respect to the quantum dots we already have done a lot of questions on the quantum dots uh, quantum computers quantum computing qubits all of that right now in this particular question first number this question is little bit different it is not specifically are uh, talking about the details of quantum computing rather it is talk, talking more about the quantum dots so you have to be little bit um, uh, careful while attempting this question so what exactly the word quantum dot means first let's understand that and then we'll get back to the question so quantum dot they are basically semiconductor nanoparticles and these are actually they they have some optical and electronic property and that is why the quantum dot these nanoparticles we are going to make them serve as a qubit qubit is quantum bits in quantum computing it is basically used for the storage part all the information of the quantum computing is stored as qubit like like normally in normal computers you have the bits na bits and byte kilobyte all that so ir irrespective of these kind of things the quantum computing is is based on the qubits so quantum dots are used as qubits because they have optical electronic properties now very interestingly the quantum dots they are all together a new class of material please be very careful 
that they are they neither belong to molecular nor belong to the bulk material so they have a unique set of or unique class of material for themselves very interestingly all the quantum dots they have the same structure and same atomic composition as bulk bulk material but they do not belong to it only the structure composition is same as bulk and their properties we can turn we can tune or we can change using the single parameters but they have some similarities but they do not belong to any of these traditional materials that we have now this is something you have to remember with respect to quantum dots and yes when it comes to the application because we are making them use uh, as in quantum computing so the the quantum dots other than quantum computing are also used to develop the lasers that make them very very efficient in terms of their application since they are used in developing the lasers they find much application in telecommunications and optical signal processing other than that other than uh, the telecommunication application because application part is very important guys you may have a separate mcq coming on the quantum dots because upsc is always interested in the application of the of these kind of things so they are used in optoelectronics displays also used for biological ranging solar cells sensors uh, they are also used as a nanoscale quantum uh, material for material science energy storage in case of quantum computers can be used for drug delivery as well can be used even for the environmental remediation very interestingly they have the application in terms of environmental remediations where they can, they can be used to remove the pollutants from the water and the soil and for all that purpose quantum dot is a topic that every upsc aspirant must must prepare if you come back to the question the very first and second statements are absolutely correct without any problem now look at the problem with the third statement it says they have different structure and atomic composition no they don't have they have same structure and atomic composition but they don't belong to the molecular bulk material so the statement number 3 is wrong and by eliminating these statement number 3 we got the answer as a so in this in this kind of question i can use my elimination technique where which can give me better results okay now this question i would say it was a medium one <clears throat> but still something that you could have risk because at least the first two statements are quite obvious and they are very easy plus this topic itself is very much in the news so i expect you guys to prepare more on that question 63 was asked with respect to the copyright act 1957 now this is important now let's assume that you don't know the details of the copyright act because it's not that famous plus it's not very recent act also but here you can apply your common sense you know about the copyright right copyright is 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 about protecting the intellectual property right so copyright act imagine what this act is going to do it is going to safeguard the creative work which are creators intellectual property this is a very obvious statement that that you can expect from the act second statement has some problem it says that copyright protection starts the moment a work is created that is fine but do you think that copyright registration is mandatory it is more of an individual choice if i want to make my work copyright or not it is more of a voluntary choice not uh, mandatory so this is very obvious kind of thing that you can uh, pick out and you can choose so my state my answer is going to be c one being correct and two being incorrect i would say this was an easy one and simply by understanding the core meaning of copyright and understanding that you can eliminate the uh, the answer right so yeah just remember one thing uh, with respect to the copyright and all these provisions do prepare all type of intellectual property rights be it your ge uh, geographical indication be it your copyrights be it your trademarks patents so do read about these topics because they are very much in the news and do read more on the intellectual property rights because upsc is it, it is one of the favors uh, favorite uh, topics of the upsc they may they may ask you any time and also remember that all like globally it is the bern convention that take care of your uh, literary and artistic work i think one of the question we asked in the test series was also with respect to the bern convention so at least do expect one individual mcq on that 
so wherever there is artistic literistic work we we always follow the guidelines framework of the bern convention now next question was a very difficult one very tough because it is asking you to focus on so many things plus it is not very common purely fact based question it is about the wolfia which is also known as the water meal now we don't know much about it let's say so there is not even a scope of attempting it so i would recommend skip this kind of uh, question because it is very difficult it take you for that purpose you have to be fully aware of the topic because it is all fact fact based question giving you the information first what exactly this wolfia or water meal is this is earth smallest flowering plant it is even smaller than the relative duckweed okay and water meal habitat it is it is basically a rootless and a stemless plant so basically it only floats on the bodies of the water water meal may become food may become oxygen source for many astronauts and that is the reason it was uh, it, it was in news recently why it is so important for the astronauts because this this smallest flowering plant water meal can actually be important producer of oxygen and can be a rich source of protein as well and that makes it useful for us where we can get nutritious food for human animals can be used for filter water filtration as well it can be used for biofuel production as well and bio remediation again uh, uh, removing the pollutants from soil and the water even space based agriculture uh, this is a very crazy concept but yes um, the world is is thinking about it that if we can start the agriculture in the space as well this particular water meal is mainly found in thailand and other asian countries but do remember the name of thailand because that is that is where you have the abundance of this particular uh, plant okay now if you come back to the question you will realize that all the four statements are absolutely correct which is rare because in such questions in my experience upsc is always going to trick you at least with one statement they may change the name of the country they may change that it is the largest flowering plant something like that okay so very rarely you get all the four as the correct one but in this case yeah it was all the four are correct very tough question <clears throat> don't take risk unnecessary in this question because it's fact based purely fact based question next is with respect to the mtcr which is missile technology control regime now this particular question is important like there are few important groups uh, that everyone should be aware of it is the uh, nuclear supplier group the mtcr then we have the australian uh, group then we have the vasnar group so these are very very important uh, regimes and these are important groups that everyone should read for your upsc preparation please understand it is only the nuclear supplier group of which india is not a member india has not yet been granted the membership of nsg because to become a member of nuclear supplier group you first have to sign the ctbt you have to sign the non proliferation treaties and everything and india has not signed that but other than that all these groups india is a member mtr mtcr was the latest group that india joined in 2016 okay so keep this mind keep that into mind nsg is not what we are member of so clearly my third option is incorrect because i am quite aware that mtr mtcr india has joined way back in 2016 eliminate the options now i am left with only two options it can be one it can be one to both now please look at the statement so my first statement is ought to be correct because uh, it has it is in both the options mtcr is a multilateral control uh, export control regime there is problem with the second statement please understand this is an informal group it is not a treaty mtcr is not a treaty so there is no question of legal binding obligation or something like that it is just a political informal political group so eliminate number 2 the answer would be as answer a medium question but something you could have attempted because you have you have the information about the mtcr it's quite important topic let me tell you a little bit more about mtcr that you have to keep in your mind like we just mentioned it is a multilateral export control regime which was founded way back in 1987 by the g7 countries g7 group you know right if you are aware of g7 and you and i want you guys to 
uh, tell me the name of the members in the comment section box let's let's uh, check your knowledge as well which countries are g7 countries please uh, mention that in the comment section box uh, like we are just discussing the uh, mtcr it is not a treaty okay it is simply it is simply an informal political understanding among the states where the, where every country every member every state tries to limit the proliferation of the missiles and missile technology because we really do not want to uh, kick start the you know weapon race in the world that's why missile control missile technology is being controlled you should not uh, like any like any irresponsible country should not have their hands on the missile technology right it covers the missiles rockets even uavs are uh, are, are also covered or oh, this is important sometime you may ask that if is uavs are like drones are covered or not yes even drones are covered and up to what particular limit they are covered so like um, all all those rocket missiles having at least 500 kg of payload and having a range of at least 300 km all of them are subjected to the mtcr where you are going to have restrictions you can't give it to the country like for then this is important for that purpose since like you know when india was not a member of mtcr you know the indian uh, missile called brahmos right so brahmos uh, is a joint project of india russia deliberately the range of brahmos was set as 295 km because we wanted to keep it less than 300 so that uh, the two countries can deal because that time india was not a member of uh, mtcr now we are mtcr member now brahmos uh, range is also going to be increased okay this is interesting point like i told you uh, very basic question everyone should be aware of now the next question is going to challenge your knowledge of the map we are going to ask you the amazon rainforest which countries are part of amazon rainforest amazon rainforest amazon basin this is a very important topic because these are called the lungs of the earth i told you earlier also like almost 20 percent of the world's oxygen is generated in these forests so maybe you and me what oxygen we are having probably it is produced in the amazon forest somewhere right now just keep the map in your head now keep the map of um, uh, south america in your head and you will understand where exactly the amazons are related so you can't uh, if you can't remember all the all the nine countries where the amazon forest is uh, spread out try to remember the countries which are not a part of amazon forest right that that becomes easy like you can think of chile chile is clearly not covered not a part of it argentina is not a part of it uruguay paraguay these are the four countries which are not part of amazon south america in general has almost 13 countries four are not part of amazon so don't remember the countries which are a part of at least try to remember the countries which are not a part of it so uh, chile is not a part argentina not a part uruguay paraguay these four countries are not part of amazon basin you can you can go and check out on the map guys this is very very important right and uh, um, that's why you can eliminate chile as the answer so three is not the answer answer has to be only three very easy question simple because amazon is quite famous quite important for the exam now next question is with respect to the polity now why this question is so important because you know recently few events had happened in our indian politics where ethics committee role was questioned and ethics committee came into the play for uh, with respect to the ethical conduct of few members now the question is which of the following you think is the primary function of the ethics committee now very simple question i am talking about the ethics committee right so it is obviously going to be about controlling examining the moral and ethical conduct of the members so very straightforward answer b because for the privileges i am not going to go to the ethics committee we have a separate committee called the privilege committee there is a separate committee for privileges and of course with respect to the corruption and all these matter again the privileges committee is more uh, taken into consideration okay this is important now straightforward question answer is b the primary function is to monitor examine the moral ethical code of conduct for the member but please remember this is only for the mps it is exclusively for the member of parliaments and our lok sabha rajya sabha both 
uh, have their own ethical committees. Now, what, what extra you need to learn about them? Let's understand. Talking about the ethical committee in parliament. So, like I told you that uh, there is a Lok Sabha committee and there is a Rajya Sabha ethics committee. Both have their own respective committee. Lok Sabha ethics committee uh, was formed way back in 2000. It has 15 member in total which are nominated by the speaker. Every member, please remember the term of the members does not exceed one year. So all the members of the committee are going to be serving for only one year term. Then they would be replaced and they, there would be another uh, set of members. Rajya Sabha committee was little bit earlier. Please, uh, this is very rare that Rajya Sabha has got their committee in 1997, three years earlier than the Lok Sabha. And in total, Rajya Sabha's ethics committee has 10 members. Again, the term is same is that is that is of one year, right? It has many, many functions like one you have just understood. And please remember, it is only for the member of parliaments for them. Uh, this these kind of things can be conducted, right? Now, this is important. Talking about the privilege committee, just to give you a little bit more information, you know that uh, uh, even Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha, they also have their own privileges committee. The numbers are same. Like there would be 15 members in the Lok Sabha privilege committee and 10 members in case of Rajya Sabha. So number wise, ethics committee and privilege committees are same. And um, the only difference is the primary role, their function for what they are going to do. Question number 68 is with respect to the money bill. Now this is probably the most important and very easy question. We all are reading money bill for so long. It says it can be introduced only in Lok Sabha. Yes, we know the power with respect to the money bill exclusively belongs to Lok Sabha. Rajya Sabha does not have much of the powers only when it is referred to the Rajya Sabha. Maximum what, what Rajya Sabha can do is can uh, delay the bill by 14 days because after 14 days, even if they pass or does not pass, does not matter. The Lok Sabha is going to uh, pass that bill. So only Lok Sabha has exclusive powers with respect to the money bill and it can be introduced only in the Lok Sabha as well. So first statement is correct. There is problem with the second statement. Why? Because it says it does not require the prior approval of the president. It does require money bill is a government bill. It's a very important bill and to introduce the money bill, a prior permission of the uh, president is a must. It is must must important. So that's why my option number two is incorrect. And we know it was very much in the news recently because government of India passed the Aadhaar bill as a money bill. Money bill provisions are under article 110. And there was very uproar when Aadhaar bill was passed as a money bill. And even that matter uh, had gone to the, to, to the Supreme Court where Supreme Court uphold, uh, it upheld that Aadhaar bill is a money bill because it has certain provisions with respect to the money bill and uh, the, the verdict was given with 4 is to 1 majority where one judge was not very much convinced but with 4 is to 1 that was passed. Now the what incidents I just mentioned. So we know that um, uh, as far as money bill is concerned as per the constitution the final power to decide whether a bill is money bill or not is only and only with respect to speaker of the Lok Sabha. Whatever speaker says, if speaker says this is a money bill, it is a money bill. But does that matter? Does that mean that it is not going to be subject to judicial review? No, it can be. Like I've just mentioned you that after 2018, while this uh, uh, verdict was passed by the Lok Sabha, uh, by the uh, Supreme Court, Supreme Court also mentioned that the decision of the speaker is final, but it is also subjected to judicial review. If there is any conflict, it is always going to be subjected to judicial review so that there should not be any uh, foul play or ultra wires in that particular case. So my answer is only three. Very simple question, very easy. Money bill is something we all are reading for so, so long. Okay. Now, <clears throat> Going by the uh, question number 69, again we have a question with regard to the parliamentary privileges. Recently, parliamentary privileges were also in the news for some, there were allegations on some of the uh, uh, member of parliaments that they had, uh, you know, violated their parliamentary privileges. Now, let's say that you don't have much knowledge 
of, on the parliamentary privileges still this question can be attempted how parliamentary privileges privileges is those special immunity special rights special uh, benefits that the member of the parliament get right so in india parliamentary privileges are governed by article 105 of the constitutional only is a big problem big problem why look at this look at the statement guys when you talk about the parliamentary privileges which are special right immunities exemptions enjoyed by uh, the member of parliament in both the houses why privileges were given at the first place why privileges are given because in order to secure the independence and effectiveness of the actions of the member of the parliament so that they can function they can work without any fear fear without any favor but at the same time the parliament has not made any special law exclusively to codify any of the privileges that means right now there are multiple sources from where the privileges are withdrawn and uh, 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 from various sources which are always consulted when it comes to any of the issue with respect to privileges namely there are five sources of the privileges that we have for the member of parliaments some of them are constitutional provisions like for example we have article 105 it is one of them it is not the only provision article 105 expressively mentioned two privileges one, number one freedom of speech in parliament and right of publication of its proceeding this this is only one uh, of the source other source being many laws made by the parliament rule of the house of lok sabha and rajya sabha many parliamentary conventions which are also a source of many privileges even judicial interpretations so you may have a question separate mcq on the sources of the privileges in indian constitution okay so remember that so far we have we, there is no codification and we are just relying on various sources in this case first is incorrect because only has a problem and even second is incorrect because it says india has well codified parliamentary privileges there is no specific code the way we have for uh, criminal code or other codes there is no code for it so in this case answer would be d very easy question everyone must have attempted because uh, you can you can understand the options are very simple and straight forward question number 70 is again from the parliamentary proceeding the question is with respect to the question r very interesting uh, concept of question r zero r this is something like everyone should be aware of first let's learn a little bit information on the question r then we'll come back to the question please remember that every time the uh, the process of the parliament the parliament proceeding starts every time it starts with the question r it's a it's a bite it's not like that uh, it's not a it's not a written rule but it is it is a normal conceived notion that every time the question r is going to be the one r period with which the the lok sabha generally start please there are few instances where the question r was delayed or it was uh, you know it was put at the secondary number of priority but majority of the time it the lok sabha proceeding start with the question r as the name says question r means what it is that one one hour particular time one hour one hour period time where member of the parliament especially the opposition members they have a privilege to ask the questions to the ministers and the purpose is to hold the ministers accountable for their functioning and if there is any doubt and the the um, ministers are bound to give the answers okay now there are there are different types of the questions will come on to that there are different like four type of the questions but that is what the question r is all about question r is very much uh, mentioned in the rules and everything which is there now it is strictly regulated there are proper rules with respect to question r there is another instrument after the question r the next one r is basically a zero r zero r is not it was never a part of the original parliamentary system it is indian innovation you don't have a zero r in any westminster government or anywhere zero r is something which india had innovated for ourselves so after question r then we have a zero r zero r is basically that particular r where uh, if there is anything any important issue which is of national importance any member of parliament can raise that particular issue 
in zero hour the purpose is to raise issue and gather the attention of all the member of parliaments that is the that is the purpose of zero hour that we have and interestingly zero hour does not find mention in the rules of the procedure where question hour is properly mentioned but there is no proper mention of the uh, zero hour that we have now i told you that uh, when when you have to ask the question when any member of parliament has to ask the question to the minister there are four different type of the questions which is very well mentioned in the constitution there would be starred questions starred means like question with an asterisk mark the starred questions are basically are those where which require an oral answer orally the member uh, will uh, ask the question minister has to respond orally since this is an oral answer even supplementary questions can follow then with respect to the unstarred questions are those where a written answer is required and thus there is no provision of supplementary questions then you have other two type of questions one is short notice questions where question can be asked by giving a notice of less than 10 days they are always going to be answered orally and then we have a very special type of the questions which are addressed to the private members private members are those members which are member of parliament but not ministers they are mps but they are not ministers that is the term that is the meaning of the term private members so even the ruling party has some private member even the opposition party has the private members now very interestingly the speaker can never ever consult with the prime minister that whether this question is to be admitted in the question or or not that decision is purely residing on the speaker and prime minister is not supposed to be consulted in that kind of matters so if you look at the question it says uh the first statement says generally lok sabha start with the question r yes which is an indian parliamentary innovation not mentioned in parliamentary rule so you see the two things are mixed here the first statement is wrong question r is mentioned it is the zero r which is indian parliamentary innovation not mentioned in the rules so first statement is wrong even third statement is wrong because it says the speaker examine the questions whether the question is admissible in consultation with the prime minister because that is not going to be a democratic process speaker is supposed to be neutral speaker is not a you know person belonging to the is not supposed to work for the government it is supposed to be neutral person so consulting with the prime minister will make the things very undemocratic right now this is very obvious i mean you can you can guess it very well that this is going to be very undemocratic process right so i am going to eliminate number 3 i am going to eliminate number 1 my only answer would be b uh, like like 2 uh, questions can be asked to ministers as well as the private ministers we have seen all the four type of the questions answer is 1 i mean this question was a medium one but i think you you could have attempted it very easily because number 1 and number 3 are clearly wrong right that is the that is the uh, that is the way you are supposed to proceed with it question number 71 is again very um, important question where we are talking about the reservation question 71 says reservation is always a boiling point in india with this context you are supposed to give the right answer now again this is very important question you need to have little bit knowledge of the history of reservation um, then you can simply uh, solve this particular question and i i can tell you how you are supposed to eliminate certain things now please remember in the original constitution original means without amendment the one that we adopted and enacted uh, in 1952 that uh, that particular uh, sorry 1950 the original one is from 1950 26th of uh, january where, which we celebrate as a republic day of india so the original indian constitution without amendment had no explicit provisions with respect to reservations it was later under article 46 dpsp the government formulated the reservation policies and that too was formulated only for 10 years the initial reservation was given only for 10 years for with respect to where where the government provided reservations to sc and sts and please remember even obcs were not a part of the original reservation policy it was exclusively for sc and st with respect to their educational institutions and jobs 
jobs being covered under 16 educational institutions covered being under 15 there were separate uh, subsections which were added okay please understand so two things to remember number one original one does not have any explicit provisions no obcs were covered and only for the 10 years it was provided now the supreme court uh, has recently gave a verdict in terms of economic weaker section quota like uh, we have recently got uh, uh, you know one there is a additional reservation which government of india had provided there was a 10 percent reservation given to all the uh, you know economic weaker section people but of course those economic weaker section are not going to be covering the sc and st they are kept outside the purview because they already have this uh, reservation kind of thing so mainly the economic weaker section is more or less going to benefit the people of the general community and uh, there is a limit like uh, you know uh, if if any household is getting less than uh, 8 lakh rupees a year that is considered to be a ceiling uh, you know uh, as a criteria and there are other criteria also this is one of the criteria but in this why I am talking about the verdict because in this particular verdict Supreme Court had clearly said that we all know it was the Indra Sahani case where uh, the 50% ceiling was put on the reservation that uh, you know all together the reservation given to SC, ST and OBC is supposed to be 50% like at least 50% uh, people should be unreserved but Supreme Court has clarified when it approved the EWS quota it said yes 50% ceiling is there but it is flexible it is not a hard line uh, ceiling that can never be breached Though this was fixed in Indra Sahani case 1991-92, very very famous case, do read about that because in Indra Sahani case we got the 50% ceiling and there also the concept of the creamy layer was introduced in the Indra Sahani case. It's a must read verdict guys. Okay <coughs> and recently we got our 105th constitutional amendment which revived the power of a state to identify the special socially economically backward caste or socially educationally backward classes which are supposed to get the reservation right so keeping these things in, into the mind land look at the question the very first statement says originally constitution does not contain any explicit provision with regard to reservation yes it does not it does not have any reservation so first statement is correct now second says the ceiling of reservation is fixed at 50 it can't be amended in any case this is too rigid this line is too rigid we just have we just have learned it can be it is not it is flexible can be amended in some extraordinary cases so number two is not correct even if if you are not very aware you at least can uh, understand that such rigid kind of things don't go well uh, in Indian setup right Indian whole setup is little bit flexible in, in these kind of things so eliminate option number two and I am going to get my answer as B very straightforward answer so this was a medium question but but by elimination technique this could have been attempted very very easily right okay now moving to the question number 72 which is very straightforward simple question it says which of the following best reflect the constitutional morality what is the constitutional morality number one very straight first statement eliminate right, right forward it says it is about upholding what most people believe this is majoritarianism what most people believe need not to be the value of constitution constitutional morality means upholding the true spirit of constitution valuing believing the values which are mentioned or practicing the values which are mentioned in the constitution right so answer is c very straightforward you could have uh, get this answer because every other statement make no sense with respect to constitutional morality it is giving more of the sense so constitutional morality is simply respecting and following the principles and the values which are enshrined in Indian constitution upholding the spirit of the constitution and what are these constitutional values so you just have to refer the preamble to understand the values of our constitution simply you have to uh, uh, you know refer to the preamble where we talk about democracy, socialism, secularism, equality, integrity, all these values are there. Okay, very straightforward question.
I'm sure it it would not uh, trouble you at all. Question number seventy three. Now another very famous uh, statement, and this question is about the nine dash line. Very very hot topic. Hot topic because nine dash line is actually a claim, which is which is uh, which is uh, done by China over the South China Sea. Now this is purely based on the knowledge of your current affairs and international relations. Very straightforward. Very very simple to attempt this question. So if you look at the, if you look at the map, please. Here the China claims the entire, like ninety percent of the South China Sea is claimed by Chinese government. And to put their claim, you can see you have certain dash. These are called nine dashes. Now recently they have they have made a one more dash called the ten dash line. So China claims that all this area belongs to us. and they are making this claim since 1947 based on their traditional and historical maps or whatever evidences they have their historical evidences now that makes the south china sea as the most disputed water body today in the entire world this is the most disputed water body why there are six countries which are having claims on different different parts of south china sea specifically these two islands the parasel and the spratly islands these are the most uh, contested elections in the south china sea because china without informing anybody or any uh, country china had made military bases on these two uh, islands and it has it has actually rung the bell that china is trying to militarize the whole south china sea and this is very important water body guys why south china sea is of so much importance because if you are going from indian ocean to pacific so if you have to go from indian ocean to the pacific you you are crossing the malacca strait the very first body it is it is the south china sea that is the gateway of the pacific ocean and that makes this water body even more more important so you i hope you are aware of the nine dash line and uh, uh, i told you that now they have got this in 2009 they have made a 10 dash line also where they are claiming 90% of the south china sea now question number 74 again very simple very straight forward question based on your knowledge of current affairs it is p20 summit relates to which of the following uh p20 it has a connection with g20 okay remember it this way it is basically g20 parliamentary speaker summit that was recently hosted by india there are many sub summits now you already know that g20 is probably the most important topic that is going to be a part of your upsc exam right because india hosted g20 for the first time so very obvious you are going to expect lot of questions coming from g20 but there are many sub summits or sub conventions or many meetings that that were made before the g20 and even some of them are during the time of g20 so do read all of them now this question i would say this was an easy one very easy to attempt it has nothing else to do with any or the other things so what exactly this p20 summit is g20 all g20 members now please be careful about one thing from today onwards you have to remember g20 is all about 19 countries and two regional organizations european union as well as african union because african union has recently been added by india under the g20 summit right this is that 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 is important for you to update your traditional knowledge now g20 parliamentary speaker summit which is called p20 india had hosted recently the theme was same as g20 one earth one family one future what exactly this parliamentary speaker summit is all about see the aim of this summit is to bring parliamentary dimensions to global governance to you know to make all the uh, parliamentary heads the speakers of all different different countries under one head one roof where they can build political support for international commitments right where they can promote all the speakers like we have from india it is going to be speaker of lok sabha now the way every country has a parliamentary speaker so the purpose is to make them meet and discuss and promote inter parliamentary cooperation enhancing the engagement between the governments and parliaments that was the whole idea before uh, behind the p20 summit now something that you have to remember 
this particular P20 summit, the P20 had four high level sessions and you may have a question separately coming on that as well. In this P20 summit, there was an agenda 2030 for sustainable development goals. There was uh, sessions on sustainable energy transitions, mainstreaming the gender equality and transforming people's life through the public digital platforms. So do remember these four agendas or four high level sessions. You may have a question coming directly on them as well. Question number 75 is with respect to the Char Dham privilege. Now I have a warning for you. What warning? Char Dham privilege is different. And then there is something called as Char Dham project. The two things are very different. Char Dham project is exclusively for the state of Uttarakhand where Yamunotri, Gangotri, Kedarnath, Badrinath are going to get connected by the highways. That is Char Dham project. And this project is very, uh, um, you know, it has a lot of criticism as well. Because many people say that, you know, well, you are going to do all this heavy construct construction connecting the four uh, religious or spiritual sites, uh, you know, pilgrimage sites you are going to put the geology of Uttarakhand under so much pressure and you may have some unprecedented uh, things. And very recently we have seen like one, uh, one tunnel got collapsed. If you, uh, if you remember near Yamunotri, one tunnel collapsed. It was a part of the Chardham project. But the question is not asking you Chardham project. It is asking you Chardham privileges that we have in India, the four holy places uh, for all the for all the Hindu majority uh, Hindu uh, Sanatan Dharam uh, believers, so we have the Char Dham, and they are the Badrinath, Dwarka, and you have Jagannath Puri and the Rameswaram. Understand in the fourth direction, fourth corners of India. So be very careful. The question is not about the pilgrimage uh, project, but pilgrimage Dham, and that makes the first statement as wrong. The second statement is absolutely correct. It's we are talking about the Kaling school of temple, uh, temple architecture. Now, if you are not aware, if you're not sure that it belongs to Nagara temple or what uh, type of style, just focus on where is the Kalinga. We know the Kalinga is, a, is in the state of Odisha. So Odisha is still considered to be in terms of the temple architecture. You know that Indian temple architecture is divided into the Northern style, the Nagara style and southern style which is called the Dravida style. In between we have the Visara style. So the position of the Kaling is still as a part of the northern side of India, right? So that makes it qualify that Kalinga is a part of Nagara style. So I think very easy question and something you could have attempted with your common sense. And when we talk about the Kaling style, what makes it very, very special? The Kaling style of architecture is a Hindu architecture of temples. Uh, which belongs to the state of Odisha, used to be called as Utkal. Utkal we still use uh, in Indian geography if you remember. So uh, this particular coast of India is still called the Utkal coast. Uh, if you have read the uh, geography, Indian geography, it is still called the Utkal coast. It is one of the gateway through which the Bay of Bengal branch enters into India during the advancing monsoon. Uh, talking about the Kaling temple architecture, yes, it has three distinct type of temples. Within that Kaling, it has three different type of temples. Look at this. These three dif distinct type of temples belong, uh, like they are known as, we have the Rekha Dula, then it is called the Kharkhara Dula, and then we have the Pida Dula. And every, everything has some speciality. Like for example, you talk about the uh, Pita Dula, which is the, the smallest one that you have seen in yellow color. It constitutes the dancing and offering hall. And that's why they are they are uh, not of greater height, they are of less height. Whereas Rekha Dula and Karkara Dula, they have the sanctorums where the deity uh, of the temple belongs, right? So that's why look at the height. Height is a bit longer for Rekha and Karkara Dula. So this is an important uh, temple architecture. And overall, I suggest everyone to prepare, must prepare the temple architecture because it is one of the uh, most important topics that you are supposed to prepare in your exam temple architecture then you have the paintings everything is very important for the upsc exam now next question was a bit difficult one why i'm calling it as a bit difficult one because this the the statements are quite confusing 
and uh, you are supposed to figure out which statement is not correct two things you have to be aware of number one it talks about the national monument authority it talks about archaeological survey of india and a very important act which is called amasr called ancient monument archaeological site and remain remains rules keep these three things into the mind and first learn about the act and the rules guys so talking first about the national monument authority what is the national monument authority as the name says it's a statutory body that we had set up under the amasr act but which particular act the amended one not the original one it was set up in the amended act 2010 keep this in mind whereas if you look at the archaeological survey of india asi was also set up under the amsar act but it was under the original act so archaeological survey of india 1958 the original act both are statutory bodies now you are you are at least aware that we got uh, national monument authorities is quite younger than the asi now there the two bodies are set up under the same legislation different times but has different functions when it when it comes to the uh, national monument authority its task is management of the prohibited and regulated areas around the centrally protected monuments one of the main work that nma is supposed to do is to consider granting permission to applicants for the construction related activity if anybody wants to make any construction near any of the uh, uh, you know protected monument then first they have to take the permission of the nma nma also make recommendation to the central government for grading and classifying the protected monuments and uh, protected areas of the national importance whereas if you look at the asi archaeological survey of india its main job is to do the archaeological research and to protect those archaeological sites so though the two acts are there but they have very clearly defined functions okay two very clear defined functions also the nma is primarily responsible for protecting preserving the monuments but asi primarily responsible for archaeological research conservation that we all already had learned please remember the as per the uh, amsar act and the rules under it if there is any protected site let's say this is my uh, protected site okay any protected site at least 100 meter be careful 100 meter radius there should not be any construction and other than this 100 additional 200 meter radius was uh, also to be made where you can do some construction but only after taking the approval of national monument authority so the purpose is to you know protect the monument and to make sure that there is not any kind of activity which is going to damage that particular uh, monument right this is important this kind of provisions these kind of 100 meter and then 200 meter buffer uh, 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 you know protection equally applies to significant and even insignificant monuments this is important now if you look at the question guys it asks you to give the answer as the incorrect one first and second statement has no problem both are absolutely correct the problem is with the statement number 3 why it says there is a provision of 1 km radius no it is not 1 km it is just 100 meter radius followed by a 200 meter buffer where else we have learned about the 1 km radius don't get confused it was the eco sensitive zones the eco sensitive zone there there is a requirement of 1 km radius this is talking about the uh, amasr rules so two things are different for every ecological sensitive zones minimum even supreme court had ruled that minimum 1 km area needs to be protected as or needs to be classified as eco sensitive zone so which statement is not correct answer is 3 now this question again was a tough one this was a tough uh, many times you may have some issue you can take a risk but only on only if you are uh, sure about at least two statements out of 3 if you have absolutely no clue then please skip because uh, you have more chances of getting the stuff wrong than getting it right 
क्वेश्चन नंबर सेवेंटी सेवन नाउ दिस क्वेश्चन इज विद रिस्पेक्ट टू ओके यू हैव टू फिगर आउट विच स्टेटमेंट इज नॉट करेक्ट अगेन दिस इज अ वेरी डिफिकल्ट क्वेश्चन एट द फर्स्ट इंस्टेंस नाउ लेट मी मेक इट वेरी सिंपल फॉर यू द क्वेश्चन वॉन्ट्स टू टेल वॉन्ट्स टू आस्क विच स्टेटमेंट इज नॉट करेक्ट ओके नाउ इफ यू इफ यू रीड द फोर स्टेटमेंट्स देखो समटाइम्स यू डोंट नो द राइट आंसर but sometimes out of the difficult statement there is one statement which is very easy and something that you can figure out the first statement talks about the budina konda say let's say i have no idea about it and i'm totally unaware of this fact because it's a very typical fact because it's not a famous uh, site you know so talking about the bojan konda it's a buddhist rock cut cave i don't know if it is in andhra or let's say i, I have no idea don't worry just leave the two statements try to find out if there is any weak statement something that i can eliminate because i am supposed to figure out which statement is not correct so look at the third statement it says mahayan mahayan you know the this is a very common fact buddhism has two divisions mahayan buddhism and hinayan buddhism mahayan is more conservative no it is not if we all know it very very well that it is the Hinayan Buddhism. Hinayan Buddhism is uh, what you call as lesser wheel uh, Buddhism. Mahayana is more modern, more open, you know. And that was the basic difference between Hinayan and Mahayana. Mahayana uh, Buddhism, where Buddha is worshipped in the idol uh, format, they make an idol of it, and in the idol form, it is uh, you know. In Hinayan, only the symbols are uh, worshipped, like the lotus and elephant and all that. so hinayan is the one which is more conservative so see i have absolutely no clue about the first two statement does not matter i am smart enough to figure out that statement which i am aware of and that is going to solve my purpose so this statement may be a medium level question but something you could have attempted because mahayan and hinayan this is a very important concept guys understood so again you don't have to sometimes the question wants to wants you to wants to pressurize you but you don't have to take that load you simply have to be uh, smart enough to eliminate but now since we are talking at least you should be aware of the budina konda which is called the bojan konda see basically guys it's a buddhist rock cut cave that we have in the state of andhra pradesh okay this is important site which was uh, uh, constructed somewhere between 4th and 9th century and uh, this particular cave resembles to those in takshila that makes them very very important you can see what caves i am talking about these buddhist rock cut caves are important in general also whenever you are preparing for the buddhism please be very very careful and do prepare about the caves and monasteries of the buddhism they are important for the upsc exam now uh, i have just mentioned that hinayan is the one which is more conservative right one more important thing you must have read about one more type of uh, uh, what what you say as uh, one more division of buddhism and that is called vajrayana so vajrayana is also it is also a buddhist tradition but there specifically it it uh, belongs to it relates to the tantric practices that developed in medieval indian subcontinent but today it is mostly practiced in areas like sri lanka or some of the southeast asian nations vajrayan don't really uh, is practice in india today okay it it has a lot of uh, tantric practices so these three try to remember one more in important information since we mentioned about the uh, hinayan hinayan sometimes also known as a theravada type of buddhism so you all have to remember the mahayan the hinayan the theravada and the vajrayan kind of things Question seventy eight was with respect to the critical minerals. Already we have uh, we have discussed this question. I I clearly rem remember it was test number one I think where we discuss about the critical minerals. What are the critical minerals? You have to be aware quite well with this concept. So critical minerals, as the name says, critical minerals means those which are very essential for the economic development as well as national security. means they are going to be used in infrastructure development also going to be used for the defense services that's why economic development and national security now critical minerals they have high importance but sometimes they have limited supply a mineral is called critical when there is a risk of supply shortage and associated economic impact right 
that then we classify any mineral as a critical mineral where always and and most in most of the cases we are dependent on the import of those critical minerals where demand is very high but there is a risk of supply shortage and to specifically deal with this kind of thing our uh, ministry has got uh, a list of some 30 minerals there are 30 minerals uh, which are classified as the critical minerals in india and there is a complete list where you can read about all the 30 uh, minerals and if you look at the question all the four belong to that particular list okay so lithium niobium tantalum zir zirconium all the four are critically are critical minerals now i have one task for you guys can you tell me at least two two applications at least can you tell me the two two applications of these four in which particular areas these four are utilized if you can do that i'm sure you will get to learn a lot of things so do tell me in the comment section box the applications of that also remember even the rare earth reserves are also very critical they are part of critical minerals okay and and whenever you have to think about the rare earth reserves uh, of the total reserves in, in the world the china always leads the rare earth reserve we know that very well but you should be aware of at least top three four countries other than china it is vietnam brazil and russia india is at the fifth location so try to remember these five names at least you should be aware of the top five you never know you have an mcq where you are supposed to <coughs> Uh, arrange the countries and descending order is ascending order kind of thing right so china vietnam brazil then we have russia and india so these five are important countries when it comes to rare earth question number 79 again very very important question now this question again you can uh, solve with very much common sense why look it says amazon river we are aware of we know amazon basin we know amazon uh, everything we know about the amazon river right and we are very well since our childhood days we are aware that amazon is the largest drainage basin in the world yes it is the largest drainage system but look at the problem with it it says it starts in peruvian and is okay and it says it drains into pacific ocean absolutely no we know about the amazon river south america the the river is going towards the atlantic it is not going towards the uh, pacific so very simple map based question and the second statement is again very uh, very obvious you know that uh, el nino which is not good for our monsoon it's a climatic phenomenon of unusual warming we know el nino is the one that takes place in the southern pacific ocean now please be very aware the kind of uh, impact el nino has on indian monsoon it is also going to have a negative impact on the amazon forest how el nino is going to reduce indian monsoon it is also going to reduce the rainfall in the amazon rainforest so whenever there is an el nino uh, phenomena it is always going to be negative for the areas of africa south america even india so just try to find that connection okay this is important so in this case one is incorrect second is correct my answer is two very easy something you could have attempted easily you do must prepare about uh, the uh, el nino that is very very important guys El Nino, try to you know read more on that and not just the El Nino. You should actually prepare a larger climatic phenomena called the ENSO. ENSO, uh, El Nino is a part of uh, El Nino Southern Oscillation. So uh, I would suggest you guys to read a little bit detail on the ENSO because this can be a very important uh, question for your upcoming exam. And we know whenever there is El Nino, the trade winds actually reverse their direction. In normal uh, circumstances, this is the way the trade winds are going to follow which which make a headless cell but whenever there is a el nino event actually the whole thing gets reversed and you have a modified headless cell and wherever you have the modified headless cell you are going to have a el nino conditions el nino is a warm ocean current uh, uh, that actually replaces it is always going to replace the normal the cold humboldt current it is going to replace a cold Humboldt current which is also called as the Peru current which is on the western side of South America and uh, by replacing it it is going to rise raise uh, the temperature by up to 5.5 degrees Celsius the temperature is raised and that's why the whole headless cell gets modified into a modified headless cell right that is important 
that brings us to the last question of the day that is question number 80. The question says which one of the following statement about the geological fault is not correct. Okay, again the same logic. This question looks tough but it is not tough. Why? You are supposed to figure out the not correct statement. Okay, now look at the smartness of this question. This question is about the fault and it seems a tough topic but you read the four statements you may find one statement that you need to get the answer. Don't read the first three look at the fourth statement. Bhima river which is flowing through Bhima fault it is of no use for us. Just focus on the Bhima river we know that Bhima river is a very very famous tributary of river Krishna. The question itself says it's a tributary of Godavari. No, that makes the things easy for us. I don't have to get the knowledge of the faults. I am only stuck with my normal basic of Indian geography and the drainage system. And that takes my answer as D because Bhima river is not a tributary of Godavari. And I am supposed to figure out the not correct one. So yes, this question looks tough, but it is actually easy. Something you all must have attempted. Sometimes UPSC deliberately asks you tough questions but options become easy if you are smart enough. Talk, talking little bit more about the geological fault because since we are discussing the topic, yes. So do read the, uh, the fault line, you know, in, in any one particular rock. So this is your rock. So in that rock, there is always going to be a weaker plane and that weaker plane is, is where the fracture is going to happen in the rock because whenever... Uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, whenever there is uh, any beginning of any seismic activity, the, along the fault line, along that fracture, the rocks are going to break. And the, whenever the rocks break along that fracture, a fault line is developed. It is this fault line from where the seismic energy is released in all the directions. Okay, so that's what you call as a fault, fault line in the rock surface. And uh, where the two blocks of the rocks move relatively to each other, the one block, one block is going to rise, another is going to go down and that's exactly where the seismic energy is going to be released. The point from where the seismic energy releases is going to be called as focus, also called as hypocenter. The, the point which is the, uh, proportion, uh, uh, you know, perpendicularly above to the focus on the surface is what you call as epicenter. This is what you call as epicenter. Uh, anytime you hear any news on the earthquake, they always tell you the epicenter. Okay, so this is important topic in journal also. But we know that uh, the last statement is wrong because Bhima is a tributary of Krishna river. So again guys, sometimes you don't have to be super intelligent. You have to be super smart to solve the questions. I hope you have enjoyed this part number four. Do let me know your feedback. It is very important for us. Tell us how you like this video if you did. Give, give, give this video a thumbs up and do uh, rate our video from 0 to 10. And at the same time, stay tuned with us. All my best wishes. See you guys in the next video. And prepare hard for the UPSC exam 2024. See you guys in the next video. Take care. God bless you. Jai Hind.